Good morning. We welcome you to our 1030 worship service this morning. Thank you so much for being here and being with us as we focus our minds, our hearts, and our souls on uh, our God, our salvation through his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being here. I've got to say, since we are doing two services and socially distancing, I, um, there's some people in this room I hadn't seen in a while, so it's wonderful to see you again. I've been doing 830 service. It's great to see you guys um, and be with you. I apologize in advance that you're stuck with me leading your singing, but, uh, but here, here I am. So if you'd like to, let's stand as we begin our worship. <clears throat> oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Be if you join me in prayer. God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your word that you give us. God, I pray over us who are listening to the teachings that Jim's going to give us. God, I pray for a humble spirit to do what you call us to do. And God, I pray that through Jim's word, that it stirs up a love for Christ in us so that we can go on our week loving you and showing others you and living out the ways we should. God, I ask these things for your glory. Amen. Christ, we do all adore Thee, and we do praise Thee forever. Christ, we do all adore Thee, and we do praise Thee forever.
and we do pray to thee forever. Christ, we do all adore thee. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the wounds of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if dangers threaten, if storms of trial burst above my head, if lashing seas leap everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be Thou couldst bestow, could with this one compare a constant sense of thy abiding presence where'er I am to feel that thou art morning church thank you mark welcome back to church too mark we've been missing you actually i can vouch for him he has been at 8 30 uh but it is good to good to uh have you the, the sermon doesn't get any better at 10 30 uh if you were hoping for, for that i'm sorry but uh, hope everybody's having a great it's a beautiful weekend hope everybody's having a great weekend staying safe being well um being mindful of those who uh, have been sick, a number of folks who uh, were back this morning who uh, have been under the weather, so it was good to see them earlier this morning, good to see you. Um, I, I hope that you take an opportunity throughout the week to take a look at the bulletin that is posted. Donna posts it always Friday midday sometime. Um, it's full of news, announcements, uh, especially prayer requests. Things are going on in our church family. We haven't been publishing that just for uh, reasons uh, uh, of, of too many hands on paper, but uh, those are posted online every Friday, and I hope you have an opportunity. We'll take an opportunity to uh, check that out each week. Uh, one of the things we do in there is if I'm on top of my game, or I do my best to post the sermon title and text that we'll be looking at on on the next Sunday. And, and last week I gave her on Monday the text that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at First Peter chapter four. We've been reading together through the this little book of First Peter for the last uh, nine weeks. Uh, you, you can see. And uh, the title I gave her this week was Living for God. And I chose that because that's the, the subject heading in my 1984 NIV Bible, uh, Living for God. I read the text. Oh, that, that captured pretty well. The, the message of the text fit great with other titles that I've had in this series, Living in Exile, Looking for Hope, Suffering for Doing Good, and that kind of thing. But as I reflected on this text throughout the week, meditated on it, looked at it some more, I really think what Peter is doing is, uh, is giving a message of encouragement for us to arm ourselves. Another phrase stood out to me, and it comes right from verse 1. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with that same attitude. And so, change the title of this morning's message to Arming Ourselves. And that's what I want us to talk about 
uh, for just a few minutes this morning. Arming ourselves. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I, my mind immediately went to movies that I have seen and scenes from movies, particularly old Western movies. And you, you can imagine the scene, maybe you've seen this one, where the, the bad guys are riding up over the horizon, about to ride into, into town once again to, to terrorize the citizens of a little cattle town in the old West somewhere. But, but this time, the guys in white hats are there and they have inspired the citizens and, and everyone has gone and they've gotten their Winchester rifles and their Colt revolvers and they've armed themselves and this time they're ready for the bad guys and there'll be a gunfight for sure. Or maybe the old James Bond movies that I watched too many of as a kid, the ones where Roger Moore would step off, would stop off at the armorer before heading out to face off against the latest uh, dastardly villain. And whether he would get a, 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 a wrist watch that, that shot deadly darts or a flame throwing Aston Martin or something like that, it was always just the thing he needed to get out of the scrapes at the end of the movie when it looked like the villain's deeds were going to take over the world. But he had armed himself. I, maybe you don't watch the same movies I do. Maybe that's okay. Um, I remember growing up as a kid in the 80s, and uh, some said it was the tail end of the Cold War, but it didn't seem like it at the time. I can remember as, even as a kid kind of being a nerd and watching the evening news every night and, and I would hear words like nuclear proliferation and arms race and assured mutual destruction. And I wasn't sure what those things meant, but I got the impression that the grown-ups were all concerned that the Soviet Union, the evil empire, had their missiles pointed in our direction, and so we'd better point some in theirs, and so that's what we did. And we amassed bigger and badder and more abundant destructive weapons. We armed ourselves. We armed ourselves. But Peter's admonition here is to arm, to arm ourselves wasn't to, to run and get your Colt revolvers or your Winchester rifles or your flamethrowers or anything like that, but rather he says, arm yourselves with the attitude of Christ. And he did so, I think, because he knew that the Christians to whom he was writing scattered throughout Asia Minor in the first century trying to live faithful Christian lives in the midst of an unchristian culture, he knew that they would need to arm themselves to face the, per the suffering, the coming persecution that was about to break out. See, Peter knows that this is going to be their best defense when it came to living as aliens and strangers in the world, as citizens of heaven, as Christians in an unbelieving world. And, and you'll remember in the latter half of chapter 3, if, you're here, if you were here last week or watched online, you, you, we were, uh, Peter was talking about the suffering and the persecution, the ostracism that, that Christians in that day were experiencing just for their choice to follow Jesus. And so it makes sense that now he turns and he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body. Arm yourselves with that same attitude. Look at the way that, that Christ endured his suffering. And arm yourselves with that same attitude. So this morning, I want us to look at uh, about the first 11 verses here in chapter 11. As I think Peter reminds those Christians of the armaments with which they can prepare themselves for the difficult days which led, which led ahead. Um, first of all, let's just go back to verse 1. And he tells them to arm themselves with a commitment to righteous living. Look again at what he says there. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body... Arm yourselves with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Is done with it. 
As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. Commitment to righteousness. Verse 1, be done with sin, he says. Put it behind you. Don't live anymore according to the desires of the flesh, but live according to the desire of God. Because the desires of the flesh will lead you back into Babylon. Back into sin. He says you put that way of life behind you. And and, and here is one of those places where we might see that the majority of Peter's audience were coming from a Gentile background. They'd grown up in that Gentile paganism. And and they'd come to follow Jesus. They had made the choice. They'd been baptized into Christ. They'd made that choice to come and to follow Jesus. Having come out of a pagan lifestyle that there is described pretty vividly in verse 3, right? Here you see sexual sin of all of all sorts. You see sins associated with the abuse of alcohol. You see idolatry named. That that placing of some sort of activity or person or idea over God in one's life. You can't read this and tell me the Bible's not relevant today. Right? Peter says, don't go back to that old way of life. You left it behind when you came to know Jesus. Don't go back. Now, your friends are not going to understand, are they? In fact, they'll probably try to pull you back into that way of life, right? They're going to they're gonna call you names and they're going to think that you're strange. But remember, in our baptism, remember we talked about that, that last week as, as Peter emphasize that in the latter part of chapter 3. In our baptism, you made a commitment to righteous living. Remember that. You made a commitment to live according to the desire of God and not according to the desire of your own sinful nature. And this message is for all of us, but but young people, I want you to especially hear this. You know, the crowd can be a really powerful force, can it? The crowd. You know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the crowd, the, the peers and the friends out there. If you've never been in a situation where your friends, the crowd, are trying to get you to do something that you know you shouldn't do, if you've not been in that situation, you will be. And let me tell you, you need to decide right now what your decision is going to be. You need to decide right now what you're going to do in those situations because when you get into the the heat of that situation, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late to rationally think through what your decision is going to be. When you're at a bonfire one weekend and your buddies start passing around the the beer cans or the, the solo cups filled with who knows what, it's going to be too late to think right then, well, am I going to take? Am I going to partake? Am I going to join in? Young ladies, when you're out on a date and that boyfriend is telling you, hey, if you love me, you're going to give me what I want. If you're going to wait till then to decide what you're going to do, it's going to be too late. You need to decide right now what you will do. Right now that you've made a commitment to righteous living. That you've made a commitment right right now that you're going to live according to the will of God. And by the way, boys, you should never put a young lady in that kind of situation. Decide right now. You may make a commitment to righteous living. This is an armament 
that God gives us to face the pressures of the world. Secondly, look at verse 7. A disciplined prayer life. He says, because the, because the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. Because the end of all things is near. Peter, I, I'm convinced that Peter and, and most of the believers in the first century lived with this awareness that, that the end was near, that Jesus was coming back and He was coming back any time. And I think that's still true. I know we've experienced all these years and we can get complacent. We can think, well, He hasn't come in 2,000 years. Who knows when it'll be? But I think we ought to live with that same sense of imminent return that, that Jesus is coming soon. The end is near. And I don't say that because of any kind of trying to read the tea leaves or the current events or anything like that. I think the end is near because Jesus said, I'm coming back. And he didn't tell us when. Because of this, he says, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. So that you can pray. I think a disciplined prayer life is one of the best defenses and offenses when you think about it that we can have against the devil's evil schemes. This was, this was Daniel's secret weapon, wasn't it? We've talked a lot about, the, about Daniel and his friends several centuries before Peter writes, but how Daniel was kidnapped from his home in Jerusalem, hauled off into captivity, into exile in Babylon, and how Peter draws on a lot of that uh, symbolism, a lot of that imagery when he talks about being aliens and strangers and living in a foreign land. And Daniel's secret weapon was prayer, wasn't it? Daniel was hauled off into captivity. He was, he was told to eat Babylonian food and wear a Babylonian name and worship the Babylonian gods. Only he wouldn't do it. Instead, he you would find Daniel up in his room with his face towards Jerusalem praying to God, praying to Yahweh. And I think that was his secret weapon. That's what kept him connected. That's what kept him connected so that he was able to withstand the forces of the culture that were trying to indoctrinate him and assimilate him back into Babylonian paganism. And his enemies conspired against him because of it. But even with that, I'm convinced it's what, Dan, it's what got Daniel through. And I know recently, I, because I've talked to a lot of you, and I know uh, my, myself, a lot of us, we've just been feeling down. Have you ever, ha, during this season, have you just been, have you just felt different? Have you felt down? One, one friend said, I just feel blue. There seems to be this general malaise. I, I just describe it as a funk. I just, I'm, I'm just in a funk right now. And I, and I chalk it up to the fact that we're experiencing stresses and anxiety and uncertainties that we've never experienced before. And, and things aren't normal. We're trying to kind of get back into things, but things aren't normal. And we're not really sure it, when or if they're ever going to be. And we're just in a funk. But I wonder too if I'm feeling this way because I'm not spending enough time connecting with God. Is my prayer life really all that disciplined? I pray, I do, but I'm, I'm not very disciplined at it. I pray throughout the day. I don't have those set times, those, those disciplined times to set apart and pray. What's your prayer habit? Let me challenge us. If you've been feeling this way, maybe even if, even if you haven't, let's do something as a congregation. Let's double down on prayer. Whatever your prayer habits are, let's, let's double down. Let's spend more time, more energy, more effort, more intentional time in prayer over this next week and see if we don't feel differently next week. See, I wonder if that's part of why... I don't feel like things are quite normal. Well, they're not normal. It means we need to pray. That's the best defense we've got. 
And third, as Peter goes on here, look at verse 8. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Folks, I think that the fellowship of the church is so important. He says, love each other deeply. And when, you, know, you guys know when I say church, I'm not talking about the building. Those Christians would have had, uh, that Peter was writing to would have had no concept of a church being a, a, a building, an institution, or even a service. Church was about the people that they had relationships with, the others who had chosen to follow Jesus. Peter says, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Some of you may read this and you think, oh man, that's great. If I just love people more, then God will forgive me of my sins more. I don't think that's what Peter's saying. I think what Peter is saying here is that if you love each other deeply from the heart, then you'll be more likely to, to overlook each other's offenses. To, to overlook, um, well, that's what the proverb the writer of Proverbs says, Proverbs 19 and verse 11. I love this phrase, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It's to his glory to overlook an offense. Now I realize this is really countercultural these days, right? Overlooking each other's offenses. Some of us are so used to being offended that even reading this proverb offends us. But I think Peter is admonishing us to love one another so much that we can be patient with each other. We can overlook one another's offenses or irritants. Now, think about your family. We do this in the family, right? Think about, in my family, nobody, you guys know this, nobody can get on my nerves like my children, right? Right? I mean, they've got it, you guys got it down to an art, right? Yeah, they've studied, they've studied this somewhere. They know how to get on every nerve. And they know how to push the envelope just far enough till that nerve snaps. And then they go a little further. But you know what? All is quickly forgotten. I love them. All is quickly forgotten. At least forgiven. And we can laugh about it most days, right? Because we're family. Sometimes the people you love the most are the ones who are the worst. But they're the ones we can forgive the first, right? Or ought to be. That's how it ought to be in the church, Peter's saying. This is the kind of relationships that we ought to have with one another. We just love each other so much. We can be patient. We can overlook one another's irritations. And Peter goes on to list three more specific ways that we can love one another as he goes on in the text. Notice verse 9. He says, first of all, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Oh, somebody's coming over to dinner. I've got to vacuum the carpet again. No, without grumbling, offer hospitality. This would have been really important in the first century as evangelists traveled all over the uh, the country preaching the gospel, they relied on the hospitality of other believers who would, who would provide them with food and lodging and, and sometimes financial support. They didn't have Hampton Inns to stay in as they traveled. They relied on other Christians to provide those things for them. Now, there are a lot of ways we can show hospitality today. As we greet guests to our services, as we have one another over into our homes. And I know that one of the effects of this season has been really an attack on hospitality, right? We've even had to, we haven't even gotten our organization back up to, to have official, you know, greeters at the doors like we used to have. But what if folks just went outside and greeted guests in the parking lot? Nothing to say we couldn't do that, Right? We can get creative in showing hospitality. What are some of the resources we have? How can we share those resources with others? Offer hospitality. Secondly, he says, each one should use whatever gift he's received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. 
being faithful stewards of the gifts God has given us. God, God gives us all gifts and talents and uh, abilities. and He intends for those to be used for the common good, Paul would say. To serve each other. This is how we steward God's gracious gifts to us. And finally, verse 11. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. In other words, he says, choose your words carefully. It's awful easy to speak without thinking. Sometimes we say things that hurt other people's feelings, that, that hurt others. Peter says, speak as if you were speaking the very words of God. Speak with respect. Speak with civility. Speak with humility. Speak to build each other up instead of tear each other down. Above all, love each other deeply. Church, I think this is more important now than ever before. The devil is using every trick in the book to get at us. He wants to, his intention is to divide us. He wants us to turn against one another. He wants to turn us inward and not outward where we can make an impact for others. And I think we're all feeling it, aren't we? He's got some of us so scared we won't leave our homes. And he's got others so insensitive we can't see past our own biases. I heard somebody say this week that uh, we seem as a culture to have lost our ability to see things from other people's point of view, other people's perspective. I don't know that we ever really had that ability, but, but that certainly seems to describe this day and time, doesn't it? Man, the devil is good at what he does. And if he can divide God's people, he can defeat God's people. Or so he thinks. He's done a pretty good job in the world. I can't think of a time in our country, at least, where we seem to be so divided. Not in my lifetime. We keep talking past each other. Church, we can't let that happen in the church. We can't let the enemy divide our love for one another above all else he says so vitally important not just for our survival but for our witness for our testimony to Babylon that God's ways not ours that God's ways are the best ways is that the testimony we're showing to the world one final thought and then a benediction he goes on to say in the latter bit of verse 11, you see here, he said, if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. You may be thinking, preacher, there's no way. There's no way this country is going to come together right now. There's no way the church can have this kind of unity right now. There's no way, in fact, I can, ha I can uh, pray with the sort of fervor that I need to. There's no way that I can live the righteous kind of life that God desires. There's just no way. And Peter says, you know what? You're right. There is no way. If you're trying to do this on your own. I want you to notice here where the strength to do these things come from, comes from. The strength comes from God. God provides what we need. None of this is expected to be done under our own power. God provides. And here is where, church, we must lean into the power of God. Into the power of Almighty God which comes to the believer through His Spirit and gives us the strength to endure the strength to serve, the strength to pray, the strength to love one another when it's not easy. This is why Peter can say then that God is praised, right? 
I mean, if we could do these things on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus. We would be praised. But Peter says, so that God may be praised. God is praised because He's the one who gives us the power to do this. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this word. Father, we do struggle sometimes to live faithful to you in the midst of our world. And though I'm sure it doesn't compare to what others have experienced in the past, Father, our experience is real and we pray for your power, the power of your spirit to fill us, to endure Father, to pray with the kind of fervor that we need to pray with. Father, to to live the kind of life that honors You. Father, to love one another deeply, even when it's difficult. Father, give us the ability to do these things, to stand against the forces of this dark world that some days seems very, very dark. Father, help us to be a light. Help us to be a light to the testimony of your power and your Son. And we pray in his name. Amen. If we can encourage you this morning, we don't want to leave uh, without giving everyone an opportunity to express need for prayer. If we can encourage you uh, in any way, let us know how we might do so while together we stand and together we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a look my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten to black and free. Fill the top layer off this communion cups. We'll give thanks for the bread. Let's pray. Our Lord and Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for this time we've got to be together and enjoy this communion feast, Father. At this time, we'd like to give thanks for the bread, which represents the body of Christ who died for our sins. Bless us now, Lord, that we might partake of this. In a Pleasing manner, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you get the second, lay it together. Let us pray in a light manner, Father, we're thankful unto thee for this cup which to us as Christians represents Christ's blood that we shed for our sins. Again, Lord, bless each one of us as we partake of this. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. As you know, in the windows and in the foyer, there are 
trays to leave your contribution. And right now we'll, we'll pray for that. Father, we thank you for all the way, many ways that you bless us, Father. We thank you for this opportunity we have to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with, Father, to be used in your service and for the service of others. Lord, it's our prayer that this will, this will be given and used in the way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. few announcements here before we depart. Um, we got notice this morning that Ms., uh, Sister Ann Bedingfield is in the hospital and evidently quite ill. And so she had asked that we be in prayer um, uh, for her. Uh, I don't have a note of what hospital she's in, but uh, please pray for uh, Sister Ann Bedingfield uh, this week. Uh, there are bins located around the building for candy donations for our trunk or treat activity. Um, and make sure those are individually wrapped uh, candy pieces when you uh, make those purchases. Um, it's college care package time, and uh, you're asked if you'd like to participate, uh, get with Tammy Mullins on the plan for this year for our college kids, how we can show those kiddos that are away from home how much we love them and, uh, and miss them. Uh, October 23rd and 24th is the men's golfing retreat. I encourage you to get with Keith Kilpatrick for all the details on that, men. Um, and then the trunk or treat activity will be on Wednesday night, October 28th from 6 until 8 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, because of health concerns, this event will be for Washington Street children only, trying to limit our uh, exposure uh, and whatnot. Uh, there will be a limited number of tables, so if you're interested in decorating a table, I uh, encourage you to sign up. There's On the bulletin board downstairs, there's a sign-up sheet where you can uh, claim a table to decorate and participate in this, uh, this activity on October 28th. Um, this, year, this year, there will not be a meal, uh, and, and, so, uh, we, and, and again, we ask that you hand out only prepackaged, um, individually wrapped candy. And they're also asking for no homemade candy this year or homemade treats, just limit it to... Uh, uh, things that you can purchase um, and then also re refer to the online bulletin for more news and information uh, of relevance to the congregation and if you'd like to let's uh, pray as we close out our service holy father we come to you this hour praising you and honoring you as the one true and living god you are the creator of all things and we are humbled that you um allocate time and grace and mercy and love for us in all of your magnificence. But Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace toward us. We thank you for your son Jesus who gave his life here on earth as a, as a sacrifice that our sins could be washed away through the shedding of the blood of that perfect lamb. Father, we ask you this morning to be with Sister Ann Bedingfield in her illness and others that we may not know about, that the true physician that you are, you will heal them, bring them back to our presence and our fellowship in health so that they too can join the, in service to you. Be with us this week as we go about our work, our school, and other activities. Help us to be shining lights to uh, bring people to an awareness of you as the true God and your Son as the only Savior. Uh, be with us, and it's through his name that we pray. Amen.